Welcome into the Ether, a podcast focusing on all things Ethereum, the leading blockchain for decentralized applications. I'm Eric Connor, your host and founder of ETHUB, a decentralized information hub for Ethereum. Into the Ether features deep dives on topics with prominent guests in the community, as well as ETHUB weekly recaps featuring Anthony Sassano. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the ETHUB Weekly Recap. In these episodes, Anthony and I discuss the ETHUB Weekly Newsletter, which covers recent events in both the Ethereum ecosystem and crypto space as a whole. Today, we will be discussing the news from January 21st to January 27th. Hey, Anthony, how's it going? Good, good, Eric. How are you? Good, good. So as is tradition, you want to walk us through the ETHUB Newsletter? For sure, for sure. So I want to start with an explosive report that Masari put out um, in regards to XRP, uh, Ripple, same thing, right? There's no use to calling it <laughs> different things. But anyway, this report went through uh, basically uh, the XRP circulating supply, um, you know, wh- where it's locked up, uh, who currently holds it, how much is actually circulating. Um, and they came to the conclusion that the circulating supply is overstated by, I think it was 40%, which was about $6 billion worth of market cap. So they actually adjusted their metrics on on-chain effects, which is their kind of um, metrics arm of Masari to reflect this, which dropped XRP to, I think it's a $6 billion market cap. So it dropped it to third place again. Um, but obviously this report generated a lot of controversy within the XRP army or XRP community or whatever people are calling it. Um, and Ryan copped a lot of, uh, Ryan um, Salkis, the the, uh, the founder of Masari, copped a lot of hate for this on Twitter, even as far as people ringing up and reciting his wife's birthday um, to him over the phone and then hanging up, which um, obviously he was pretty shaken by. Uh, he spent, you know, after this report went live, he spent, I think it was a couple of days just battling these trolls basically I mean, it was pretty bad to see he got pretty emotional about it which is understandable and you know i don't think this should happen just because they they released a report that wasn't positive towards xrp the community shouldn't be constantly attacking the data through you know personal attacks or things like that they should just look at the report and then try to break it down from there but you know as we all know the xrp community isn't very interested in that and they um they're quite aggressive unfortunately yeah, so I did see this and you know, it's first of all I want to say it's good to see someone like Basari kind of diving into supply models. It seems they're going to kind of bring this beyond just XRP because you know, there's a lot of projects out there where have a stated supply but maybe, you know, a lot of that's either locked up or not accessible or maybe not completely honest and in uh, Ripple's case it looks like, you know, there was less than there was thought to be, so that shaves some off the market cap. You know, I'm not very shy in my opinion about Ripple. I um, kind of say, I've been saying for years, I don't believe it's a cryptocurrency. I don't think it should be even included on things like Coin Market Cap and Masari. Um, I'm glad to see people kind of diving in a little bit deeper into um, what I would consider a very shady supply model where the owners kind of have a very large amount to themselves and occasionally dump it kind of on. I guess I'll say the believers of it who who have to buy it up at that point. Um, you know, at one point it was actually removed from Coin Market Cap back in the day, but then suddenly got re-added. Lots of rumors around why that happened. But you know, there's definitely no reason whatsoever to be threatening someone who's running a uh, blockchain analytical site just for doing actual reporting on this stuff. But I guess it's cool. I'm a big fan of Masari. It's cool to kind of see the unique things they're bringing to the space. I've completely switched away from coin market cap to using them exclusively at this point. Um, so it's unfortunate this happened to Ryan, but I guess I would say just keep it up. Um, you know, I guess if I had to make a suggestion, I'd say let's just remove XRP altogether from these coin cap websites. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, it, a lot of questions came up after this report, um, including the ones you've outlined about whether XRP should be treated as a cryptocurrency or not. Like, I'm sure, um, you know, a lot of people share the same opinion as you, um, myself included, where it's not really a cryptocurrency. It was it was basically completely pre-mined by Ripple. Uh, they issued 100% of the, the tokens themselves. There's no mining, none of that stuff, no um, staking issuance, nothing. Basically, they... They gave a lot of it away to co-founders uh, and then they kept a lot of it for themselves. I think originally they started off with 80% or 90% to themselves and they gave the rest to um, co-founders and things like that. 
which you know is what's included in this report basically running through who actually owns this xrp what kind of lockups there are because there are various lockups in place because um the liquidity isn't there to eat a lot of the um the the dumping that happens of xrp because if someone wants to sell and they've got maybe five percent of the supply they'll they might try and sell it on market pushing the, the price down even more it's very transparent about what they they're, they're trying to do they try to hide it but it's very like it's very obvious um what they're trying to do they're trying to keep that the price high um by restricting supply i mean i had this theory for a while i i, I kind of wondered to myself why is xrp always um pumping so hard during not even during bull markets just in general and i think it's just due to the fact that a lot of the supply is currently locked like i think uh, their Ripple still has like a very high percentage, maybe fifty percent or something around that, still locked in escrow, um, and that's going to take uh, that. That gets paid out every month, um, so that's going to take quite a while before we see that entire supply put out into the market. Um, so it's just yeah, a bunch of shady stuff all around. I know um, the block has done uh, a bit of research on XRP and Ripple as well. Like uh, Mike Dudas there um, did a thread a while back. If you jump on Twitter and and um, you you probably be able to find it if you search through his profile. Uh, basically, going through all the dodgy stuff that that Ripple has tried to do with regards to XRP, you know, from cu- from trying to decouple XRP and Ripple into two separate things, where people actually claim that Ripple didn't um, has nothing to do with XRP. It's just it's just a mess. So yeah, as as you said, glad to see more reports coming about out about this with actual data. Um, and if and if all the uh, kind of XRP army can muster in response is to attack people personally, then it clearly shows that the reports um you know quite sound in my opinion so yeah it was it was great to see that and keep up the good work masari for anyone that um you know that works there, there that's listening so enough <laughs> enough xrp kind of hate i guess <laughs> we'll move on to some more positive news so this week a person on twitter posted uh what was a, uh what was thought to be leaked screenshots of the galaxy s10 uh, so uh, basically, the S10 in, um, is going to include a native crypto wallet, and it shows that ETH is an option um, on the actual images, but apparently uh, BTC and BCH will be supported too. Uh, this is huge. This is huge for adoption. Um, if everyone that has a Galaxy S10 has a, a you know a, a crypto wallet inside their their phone, basically, um, it makes it just so much more easier for people to be onboarded without having to maybe maybe they don't want to download a third party wallet. Maybe they just rather use a native wallet. So it's really great to see bigger companies like Samsung getting involved in this. Yeah, this is cool. I guess it's hard to kind of say how valid these leaks are until I guess the phone comes out or an announcement is made. I haven't seen it debunked to this point. And I mean, the screenshots definitely look believable, but I, you know, I'm a pretty big Apple fanboy. And in the past, there's been a lot of leaks kind of like this that ended up not coming true. So I guess I'll hold my breath till then. But let's go with the assumption that it is true. If that's the case, this is huge. I mean, Mobile phones are kind of the obvious place, in my opinion, where kind of crypto wallets will go next. Um, We have a lot of third-party ones launching now. But the cool thing about manufacturers putting these wallets on by default, especially on something like the iPhone, you already have a secure enclave, which kind of stores your Face ID or Touch ID um, keys to get into your phone. That we could use something like that as well for crypto, a lot like a hardware wallet, like your keys would be completely separated from the rest of the device. And it would essentially turn into your hardware wallet where your keys are not accessible by anybody else. And you can just sign a transaction from your phone and broadcast it to the network, much like a ledger or a treasure works today. So hopefully this is kind of the long-term goal here. I'm sure if Samsung puts something out like this, then the other manufacturers are going to respond as well. You know, and of course, not just from people that are using crypto on the day-to-day now, but this would obviously pique the interest of people that potentially haven't even heard about it or don't know much about it. If they see it built into a phone natively, they're going to start exploring and poking around a little bit. It's interesting that you mention um, Ledger there because as we know, um, a couple of weeks ago, Ledger announced a mobile um, hardware wallet that basically connects via Bluetooth to a device. So I wonder how these kind of native hardware wallets disrupt Ledger's um, device there. Obviously, maybe only the, I guess the higher end phones will have the the native wallets inbuilt. So maybe it, um, someone with like a um, lower end phone or, or a phone doesn't support it would go for a Ledger Nano X, um, you know, the mobile uh, hardware wallet instead. But it's good to have options at the end of the day. Um, and and, and I, from what I've noticed, from what I've seen, a lot of people um, tend to just use what's on the device as well. Besides the, the really popular apps like Facebook, Instagram, you know, Snapchat, all that, a lot of people just tend to use what's on the device. So having it native would be great, especially if it, you know, if it's an icon on the home screen, someone clicks it and it's like, oh, what's this? And 
you know, I think that would be great for adoption uh, if, if, if Samsung pushes it that way um, or if another manufacturer uh, pushes it as well. Yeah, absolutely. I guess there's two kind of spaces that could be effective here or affected here. It's the wallet apps, which are very fragmented right now. I think I have six or seven on my phone. So potentially kind of native out of the box apps here could kind of consolidate those into one. And then, yeah, your point about Ledger, I'm sure potentially they're sweating a little bit. I, I do think kind of like I mentioned, for them to really have direct competition, this would have to be, your keys would have to be on some kind of secure chip on the phone solely dedicated to your crypto storage. Because if it's still kind of accessible by the OS, I'm sure a lot of people wouldn't feel too comfortable storing a majority of their crypto on it. Yeah, for sure. And I guess people might want to have the device separate to their phone as well, uh, rather than carrying around one device that has everything. Um, and that's a, like that's kind of a, a personal concern I had about the Ledger Nano X. I, I personally won't use a mobile hardware wallet simply because it just adds another layer of um, kind of, I guess, vulnerability, you could call it to, um, you know, maybe my device gets stolen or, um, while I've got it out with me. I prefer to keep my device in a safe place, um, you know, somewhere where, where no one can find it really. But yeah, we've got more options. We've got, as you said, there's tons of options out there. So hopefully we can kind of develop a standard around this um, and see what what pops out with regards to wallets, basically. Cool, cool. So next on the agenda is your favorite topic, the Bitcoin ETF. So the Van Eck-SolidX Bitcoin ETF application was withdrawn this week. So basically, it is no longer going ahead. The final date for the decision on this ETF was February 27th originally, but the um, CBOE exchange announced that they withdrew their application due to, well, I mean, one of the reasons was due to the government shutdown um, that happened in the US. So uh, this was speculated on for a couple of weeks by some of the crypto lawyers on Twitter uh, that this might happen. And, you know, it, it obviously materialized. And I can't say I'm surprised, to be honest. An ETF being the holy grail of crypto is just uh, so a fool's errand at this point. I, I think we should really stop putting so much um, emphasis on these ETFs. And I, I know you share the same opinion, Eric, uh, but I'd like to hear your take about this. Yeah, I guess all I can do is kind of laugh at this point. You put it perfectly. It's a fool's errand. I think I said on maybe our second ETHUB weekly recap we ever recorded, I said, in my opinion, we're not going to see a crypto ETF till 2023. I still stand by that. I don't think it's anywhere in the near future. I pretty much read through every decision um, that's put out by the SEC on and read the reasoning on why it's rejected and everyone's the exact same and I can't disagree with them it's you know that the market is unregulated there's a lot of manipulation um, there's a lot of wash trading it's hard for them to keep track of uh, kind of the exchanges are, that are out there and, and kind of what's happening on all of them and, and nothing that hasn't changed right that might change in the near future but just because someone else is submitting a different ETF doesn't mean that the SEC's um, decision for rejecting it's going to uh, change. So I think blaming the government shutdown was a little bit of a scapegoat. I, this one was dead in the water to begin with. Hopefully this is the last one. You know, it seems at this point that the crypto market has dumped more on failed ETF decisions than it has on China bans, which is saying something because I think we're at like our 12th China ban at this point. So hopefully we can finally just move on from this. And, you know, this isn't this isn't going to change adoption or use cases or UX or all the other problems that scalability that we're facing right now in crypto. It's just going to be, you know, a, a little bandaid on a huge knife wound. So I hope we can kind of put this behind us for now and move on. Yeah, exactly. I totally agree. It's interesting you mentioned the the price movements. Curiously, the the price of Bitcoin didn't really move off this news too much. I think that's due to, um, you know, as you were kind of alluding to, it's just old news at this point. Um, I think everyone's just over it. We've got so much more important things to focus on. Um, and I think the market's kind of priced in these ETF rejections already. I think it was expecting a, a rejection, basically. Um, you know, which might might point to the sign of maturity for the market, but I doubt it. I think the market just got sick of, you know, the ETF narrative, uh, as I'd like to call it, because narratives and stories kind of drive these markets, as we've seen, um, and the ETF one has been played to death. No one believes that an ETF is going to get approved. It's become a meme at this point, <laughs> which is really funny to see. So, um, you know, I don't really know when we'll get one i mean as you said you think 2023 i'm not sure i'm, I'm not really hooked into um you know the legals the regulations i don't really read the reports myself but i'll trust you on that and we'll see what happens in the next i guess four years from now <laughs> um but yeah i don't think we actually need an etf to um 
get that adoption. I think there's a lot more pressing issues that need to be solved before we can even entertain an ETF, basically. So next uh, next part of the updates, uh, I wanted to go over some project updates this week. So I think the biggest thing that happened in the kind of project space this week was the um, F Trader Donut experiment. This kind of blew up Twitter, blew up Reddit, blew up ETH Trader subreddit, <laughs> figuratively speaking, but you know, there were a, a few concerns. So this was both very exciting and um, very dramatic. So basically, I'll just give a quick background for those who don't know. Well, on ETH Trader, you are able to earn uh, what's called donuts for your um, karma points, essentially. So your normal Reddit karma points are basically converted into donuts on Reddit. And those donuts can be used for a variety of functions, such as voting on polls, um, you know, another uh, buying banner ads on the subreddit and other governance related um, things. So um, and, and this week, someone built a bridge that allowed you to tokenize your donuts. So you could turn your um, Reddit donuts into ERC-20 tokens and then trade them. So um, someone set up a uh, liquidity pool on Uniswap for donuts against ETH, and then people were actively trading it. And I think at one point the donut price spiked. I can't remember exactly what it spiked to, but it was really high. Uh, it was quite quite crazy to see that people were actually actively bidding um, up the price of, of these things. And the drama spurred from the fact that it, um, the ETH tra- some of the ETH trader mods felt like that the subreddit would turn into a plutocracy because people would just buy donuts and be able to manipulate the polls or you know um, buy banner ads and advertise whatever they wanted on the on the subreddit basically, um, which are of course valid concerns. But I think this is a really cool experiment to review and to to kind of uh, keep an eye on because I think this is going to keep happening with communities. There are tons of micro communities that have various points, um, you know, rewards and things like that that are just obvious candidates for being tokenized. I'm really excited to see what else comes out of this, um, whether we fix the kind of governance related issues because the the bridge for for doing this has since been shut down, but I, I doubt it's gonna stay down forever. I think someone um, will will revive it and we'll, we'll continue to see this happen. I've seen on, on ETH Trader, a few of the mods are discussing different solutions to this, um, but nothing concrete just yet. Oh man, I think this is my favorite story of the last year in crypto, to be honest. I guess first I've been around ETH Trader pretty sure since like day one. So I'm very kind of close to a lot of people on there and it's kind of where I grew up in the uh, Ethereum space, I would put it. Um, so I've kind of been accumulating karma on there for a while and they kind of got picked as an experiment for Reddit somehow at a point to kind of be able to use your karma points. And I believe ETH Trader is still the only one that you can do that on. But yeah, like you, you described it very well. Essentially, someone uh, created a bridge that you could then tokenize these. We basically got to see an on-chain blockchain governance experience experiment happen within, I would say, five days or so. And boy, did it go downhill quick. I mean, you literally went from this great idea of being able to have uh, use your karma for points. They were You could buy the banner on ETH Trader with them. You could use them in polls to vote. And the mod started giving some weight to those polls for actual governance. And the second... <laughs> they became tokenized, people realized, uh, maybe this isn't too good of an idea. And this is why I'm pretty outspoken against uh, on-chain governance, especially when you have one vote equals one coin. Um, because yeah, you start getting vote manipulation and those that have more wealth than others get more say in the polls. And that's just setting up for a complete disaster. But it was just pretty amazing how it just showed the power of being able to tokenize things. I mean, this was just Reddit karma, right? And people were fascinated by this idea. Within hours, something that had no ability to have value or to be traded was being traded. So you mentioned that the price spiked up. I I messed around a little bit. Uniswap, you could go on there and they were trading. At a point, I think you could trade 20,000 donuts for like one ETH, which is crazy. I mean, that's like such a high price for them. Uh, The market crashed pretty quickly, but I was playing around with it and I, I was just simply fascinated by how quickly you were able to turn something that wasn't able to be traded or have value into something of value. And I think we're going to see this a lot going into the future. People can realize that they have these things that have value in either an online community or on a website, or maybe it's in a game. And as long as you can tokenize those, you can now trade them anywhere in the Ethereum ecosystem. So again, this is one of my favorite things. I hope they kind of figure out, in my opinion, they should just not give weight 
to the voting polls for governance. And then you could still do really cool things like your donuts could be used to buy the banner. They could be used to buy really cool flair, um, maybe some kind of, you know, donation thing um, and matching. There, there's so many cool things you could do. So hopefully they just get rid of the on-chain governance aspect of this and kind of move on and open up trading. Because right now the bridge has been shut down. You can't trade them anymore. Yeah, it's interesting that you bring up um, kind of on-chain governance. <laughs> this experiment does not bode well for the projects that are attempting on-chain governance. But I think in these crypto networks that are attempting, um, you know, an on-chain governance mechanism, there's a lot more maybe thought and kind of mechanisms that are design, mechanism design and incentive design that goes into it um, outside of just the tokens themselves. Um, you know, there's a few popular projects, one live, at the, uh, well, a couple live at the moment, like Decred and um, Tezos that have on-chain governance. Um, but I think a lot of the concerns revolve around, yeah, the, the, the revolve around it devolving into a plutocracy, basically, where the wealthy just rule, um, you know, the system. And I think the arguments for on-chain governance stem from, well, the wealthy, um, you know, aren't going to want to watch their val- uh, their wealth evaporate. So they're going to do what's good for the for the, the chain. They'll vote on what's good for the chain, which I can understand, of course, but that doesn't bode well for people who don't care about money. So, you know, nation states and governments where, you know, at any point in time currently, a, you know, a well-funded government or nation state can probably take down um, Bitcoin or Ethereum just because it's it's still relatively cheap to attack it if you don't care about losing money. So if your only motivation is to destroy the thing, then I think a lot of the incentives and the mechanisms around it break down pretty badly. Yes, we can always recover, but I mean, you know, the damage is, is probably done at that point. It depends on the type of attack, depends on if it's an ongoing attack. You know, we've seen, <laughs> we spoke about this last week, but we've seen, or the week before, I can't remember, but we've seen like when chains get 51% attack, it doesn't really affect the value um, too much, which is, you know, saying something again about what if someone, you know, what if there's a contentious decision on um, an on-chain governance protocol about changing a certain thing, will the the wealthy holders vote in the best interest of the community or will they vote in the best interest of of themselves they, they're not always aligned so this discussion goes on for a very long time um i know a lot of key people in the industry uh you know vitalik vlad uh Zamfia, and gavin wood talk about this a lot they've gone back and forth with various um you know documentation of course ethereum um, adheres to off-chain governance which has worked pretty well for it so far and so does bitcoin but ethereum is more pragmatic with their on-chain governance where they're, they're open to changes whereas uh, uh, bitcoins are very conservative and um there hasn't been a planned network upgrade for bitcoin um through via a hard fork um since its inception basically the only upgrades have been via soft forks um and you know of course client um optimizations things like that but the core protocol itself has remained the same so yeah, definitely does bring up interesting questions about um, governance, um, and, and I'm glad that we get to see these things experimented in in such a fast way. As you said, f- over five days, we basically saw how a plut- plutocratic governance system just breaks down completely. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I mean, personally, give me off-chain governance any day. I think the on-chain governance solutions are just trying to put a very complex and unfounded solution into a problem that doesn't need that much complexity. I mean, I think this is just my personal view, but and something that's attracted me to Ethereum is, you know, you're kind of going to get natural leaders and groups come together to kind of lead the effort over time. I don't think kind of a truly decentralized um, way to go about that is going to be fruitful in the long run. I think it's going to delve into kind of chaos and stagnation and just not getting anything done or having chain takeovers in the in the uh, on-chain voting mechanism. But, you know, that's just kind of my personal opinion. But I think we kind of saw that <laughs> firsthand play out on ETH Trader. But moving forward, I think we're going to start to see these things play out on chain as well. Yeah, exactly. Be super interesting to see um, more of the on-chain governance chains go live in a larger capacity and see what happens then and see, you know, we won't see the downfalls in the short term on these change, chains, but in the long term, I think I think we definitely will. Cool. So next thing I wanted to move on to was a couple of Ethereum 2.0 client related updates. So I'll start with, there's a new ETH2 client. This makes the ninth client, I think that I know of. I I saw the number 10 thrown around on Twitter, but I can't find the 10th one. But yeah, so as far as I know, there's nine. So this one's called Yeath. Um, It's in reference to Kanye, like yay, um, that whole thing. Uh, I'm not a Kanye fan, so I don't totally understand it, but it is what it is. Um, This is being built in the Swift programming language by Dean 
Egan Man. I think that's how I say his last name. I apologize if it's wrong. Um, and Eric Tu of ZK Labs. Um, they've made a lot of progress over the last few days implementing the beacon chain in Swift. I've been following their progress closely on Twitter. Um, and it's really great to see um, them basically catch up to the other teams, um, you know, in some some form of capacity. And they're the first ones doing it in the Swift programming language. So the, the Swift language was created by Apple. Um, it's basically used for iOS apps. So um, it's really interesting to see th- this new client come out. And it's just another client to add to the, to, to the pile, like nine clients now. Traditionally, we've only had really two, two, three, or I think there was four, maybe still four, but two core clients for ETH 1.0. And now we have nine, um, which is just awesome for client diversity. Ethereum embraces this completely, whereas we see in Bitcoin, there's only really one dominant client, Bitcoin Core. Uh, but Ethereum loves to embrace the, the the diversity in the client. So it's great to see another one join. And, and I'm sure this won't be the last one. We'll probably see more coming out uh, over the next few months. Yeah, this is great. Like you said, it's good to have this client diversity and kind of moving from the two today to nine in the future and potentially more as well. It's going to be um, exciting. And one of the best things about this is all these teams getting active in this. I see at least on Twitter and in uh, a lot of the Discord chats and the getters, they're all kind of interacting and working together. So while you have these nine different teams, all that really means is you've got a lot of good resources on these teams working together and helping them build out instead of just you know two maybe smaller teams um that are a little more isolated and don't have as many people to bounce ideas off of but we did start a new page on ethub which is the e2, well it's actually been there a while but we updated it the e2.0 team so you can go there and you can see uh the nine teams and what their client names are what language they're written in which coding language they're written in and that is uh, and then each team has their own page as well with a little more detail so definitely suggest to go check that out uh the page title is teams building e2.0 hopefully this list continues to grow i will be curious there's a couple i think there's two being built in java artemis and Harmony, and there's two being built in Rust, which is Parity and Sigma Prime's clients. I'm kind of curious how that's going to work over time, if potentially they're going to merge, but the others are all unique programming languages. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it, it, I definitely think, you know, there's there's teams building in, uh, two teams building the same uh, programming language, see if they, they merge over time. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I don't think it's bad if they don't merge, but you know, might, might become end up being redundant, and they they decide their best um, their best decision is to merge. So we'll see how that plays out over time, basically. Um, and then another thing I wanted to talk about was the Nimbus uh, testnet simulation. So Nimbus is another ETH 2.0 client, um, basically being built by the Status team. And uh, this week they released a um, kind of guide on how to simulate a beacon chain using their their software. And this is just basically an early early um, test client. I think this is one of the first that, that's been released so far. And we're going to see this um, come out of the next couple of months, this common trend of um, client uh, test cl- net clients coming out uh, and, uh, and official test nets being stood up for the beacon chain, basically, which is super exciting because this is a huge milestone for um, ETH 2.0. It's basically phase zero. So the first big part of um, ETH 2.0. And we're going to see it play out in real time over the next couple of months. And then we're going to have, I think Vitalik mentioned he'd love to see just at least six months of... Um, of core testing on it before we, we move ahead. Uh, so there'll be a lot of bugs ironed out and everything. Uh, I do encourage everyone to get involved if you can, download a client, run it, um, submit bug reports. It'll speed up the development process um, considerably uh, the more people that are that are using it. Um, but yeah, it's just great to see so much ETH2 progress happening. Um, yeah, so did you play around with the Nimbus client yet or did you plan to, Eric? Because I plan to do it um, you know, sometime this week. I haven't yet. I did do the Prismatic Labs demo, um, which is somewhat similar to this. A few weeks back, I was messing with that. I need to get on the Nimbus one, hopefully have some free time this week. But yeah, like you mentioned, I mean, all of a sudden... Well, not really all of a sudden, but it just seems in the last couple of weeks, you know, more team announcements and all the E2.0 stuff is really picking up. I'm kind of wondering at this point if we're going to get a uh, E2.0 test net before Constantinople finally goes live, which would be kind of funny and potentially sad, I guess. Well, maybe good because that means we're getting closer to E2.0. But, you know, I'm getting very excited for this. I think we're getting close to test nets and we actually have clients up and running simulations, which means we're definitely getting close. Hopefully we get some news here in the next few weeks about when to expect these test nets coming online you know continuing with the theme of eth 2.0 i don't know if i if i um included this in the newsletter i'll feel silly if i didn't but the core researchers uh justin drake uh, danny ryan vitalik um, i think hudson was in there and uh, there's a couple others as well 
they basically did a, a, a massive AMA on Reddit, uh, on Reddit about ETH 2.0. Uh, I ended up copying a lot of these, uh, a lot of the questions and answers, well, as many as I, I could over to a Ethub page, and it was quite popular. We got a lot of hits on it. Um, so if you'd like to just read the questions and answers, I've got them on, on the Ethub page. It's under the other section on docs.ethub.io, and it just says Ethereum 2.0 AMA, um, you know, questions and answers. So you'll be able to find it all there. But there was so much meat in this AMA. I haven't gotten through all of it myself. It's 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 so comprehensive and it's just great to hear all the stuff from the researchers mouths themselves uh, because there's a lot of open questions still and they were very honest in their answers as well they weren't trying to basically be hand wavy or or uh, kind of um, dismiss things outright they were were very open to answering as honestly as they can and kind of um, their thoughts around especially the beacon chain a lot of people look uh, are really excited but they've also got reservations um, they're wondering, uh, there's a, a big looming question of, of how ETH 1.0 is going to migrate to ETH 2.0 and then what eventually is going to happen to ETH 1.0, whether it be folded into a shard or it just be left to basically become a zombie chain and eventually everyone will just migrate over and then ETH 1.0 will, um, uh, will will cease to exist. So it's great to see that the researchers get more involved um, and answer the community's questions. Yeah, I think this is a pretty good way to go about it. There's been there's so many different forums and channels and blogs and websites that all this research is happening. So I, I a lot of people have been asking kind of how do we get all this together. It seems like the Reddit uh, AMA did a good job of doing that. I still think we need a better way to kind of collate this. So I'm really glad you put it on Ethub and this Q and A. And then we also started a page kind of with the pros and cons and discussion around some of the hotter topics and questions. Like you mentioned, two of them would be, well, the first would be how to get your ETH from the 1.0 chain to the 2.0 chain. The plan right now on phase zero and phase one is to have a one way bridge to the ETH 2.0 chain. So if you want to move your ETH over and stake it early on, you can start gaining interest on that. Um, at that point, you cannot go back to the ETH 1.0 chain. That's the current plan. So there were some questions in there. You know, has it been thought that we could do a two-way bridge so that people could move their ETH back and forth? It would be less risky. And what if something went wrong? There's a lot more complexity to doing that, and that's why it's kind of slotted for phase two right now. I'm personally still on board with just the one-way peg um, because I think you know we only need like 550,000 ether staked in phase zero and one to bootstrap the chain and you know I think we're going to find that the interest being paid on that is going to be over 10 percent people are going to be willing to take that risk and as long as it's not, I'd rather do that than not delay it and add complexity to it early on um, but these are things that should be kind of open for debate and then the other one like you mentioned is the state going to be transferred over if it is how is that going to happen when's it going to happen and then how is the ETH 1.0 chain going to either live on or die out so a ton of good questions asked in here it, Definitely go look at the page. I think Anthony probably got carpal tunnel, he said, from copy and pasting everything over. So at least for his wrists and fingers, go give it a read. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I did actually give myself mild carpal tunnel because I was trying to do it so quickly because I wanted to get it out, you know, for everyone to be able to read because Reddit was, I mean, Reddit's nice. It's not too hard, but, you know, it was a bit disjointed and you had to like load extra comments and things like that manually. Um, so yeah, I kind of got that set up and, um, you know, it was well received. I think we, we received over 3000 page hits on that, um, alone in the first 24 hours, which was just insane. So it was really great to see the community support that. So I'll give myself future, uh, more couple tunnel in the future. If that, if that's the kind of response we're going to get. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I think we're going to try to do our best to create pages for these discussions. So I would suggest everyone kind of keep an eye on our ETH 2.0 section on ETH Hub. Um, and the one other thing I wanted to mention here, you know, I, I've seen a lot of people acting concerned over how some of these answers aren't solved yet. And I just say, you know, if, if all of this was solved and we knew exactly how this was going to happen and we knew it was going to happen smoothly, the price would be in my opinion, 20, 30 times higher where it is now. So this risk is baked in at this point to the price and to Ethereum in general that everyone knows this is a risky operation. I personally think we're going to get there, but you know, there's going to be growing pains. There's going to be setbacks. There's going to be tough transition periods. I think everyone needs to realize this and we can all have this discussion together. The pretty much every developer working on ETH 2.0, at least to me, has been very easily accessible for questions and always happy to answer. Um, so don't be discouraged that this all hasn't figured out from day one. 
Yeah, exactly. Yeah, especially yeah, if you're buying ETH today, you're basically speculating on ETH 2.0 being a success. Um, that's not investment advice, but that's just you know, it's basically obvious. It's like buying any any of the cryptos out there. You're betting on different. Um, things being a success you're betting on bitcoin you know being digital gold or or kind of um, becoming global money um you know ethereum's competing for that as well uh but it's trying to do a lot more um if you're buying xrp you're betting that ripple doesn't go out of business (laughs) uh man maybe i shouldn't say that but you know i think it's true (laughs) yeah hopefully you don't get personally attacked now yeah yeah better watch out for the trolls (laughs) Cool, cool. So moving on to one curious thing I saw um, on the chain this week. So Request Network becomes the second known project that raised um, funds via OCO to open their own CDP. So they announced this a few days ago. Um, they basically uh, with, uh, opened a big CDP. I think they got about 20,000 ETH in there with a, and I think they withdraw, withdrew something like 600,000 die. Um, which sets their liquidation price to forty-five dollars, and that's a pretty low liquidation price. And this kind of follows the theme of the of the projects like Aragon as well. Open their CDP and basically have a really, really low liquidation price because um, they're not trying to speculate. They just would rather hold Dai than hold Volatile F, um, which is totally understandable. You know, they could always trade their ETH for Dai instead of opening a CDP, but I think they want to. It, there's a bit of a speculative element to it, admittedly, because um, I think they want to be able to. Um, you know, go long on their on their ETH, but also hold uh, die to pay their bills, basically, because um, they're just because at the moment a lot of them are just holding their ETH and doing nothing with it. Um, you know, they, they might uh, wait for staking. Like I, I imagine a lot of these projects will end up staking um, their ETH in the long run, but you know, that's a long way off. As you've explained before, phase zero is a one way bridge. Um, you won't be able to move your ETH on in phase zero until basically phase two, which is a couple of years out at best. So. These projects want um, to do something with their ETH and without selling it. Uh, so at the moment, their only real, I guess, safest and most liquid option is to, to open a CDP. So, I mean, it's interesting to see this happen. They announced it before they did it. It's not like they were hiding. Um, so both Aragon and, and Request Network have done it so far. I'm sure there's other projects out there that might that may have done it, but uh, they haven't publicly announced from what I've seen. This is definitely interesting. I, I said, I think it was last week we were talking about maker CDPs and I was saying, I assume most, if not all of CDPs being open are being used to speculate long on ETH. I got a little bit of feedback after that episode on Twitter, people saying that I wasn't probably fully right, which I do still stand by my statement to be honest, but it seems like maybe some people are using it for other things. This is obviously a pretty good use case here. Um, it sounds like people are taking out low cost loans too to pay off things in their personal life. One very interesting thing here, and I guess I'll preface this with saying I have no idea about tax laws, so please no one take this as tax advice, but it seems like some people think that by putting ETH into a CDP and drawing DAI, that's not a taxable event necessarily, as in, say, Aragon or Request raised a ton of ETH. If they sold that or traded that for DAI, they would have to pay taxes on that gain at that point. Potentially, they're using this as a way to put it in the CDP, draw DAI, avoid taking the gain to have to pay taxes on right now and therefore having stability and die as well. I don't know. I'm completely speculating with that idea, but it just seems like something they're maybe doing. But it also, you know, it seems it's given credibility to other use cases for CDPs. I mean, as prices started to stabilize, I guess people aren't speculating as much and finding other use cases for them. Yeah, it's interesting that you mentioned the tax thing. I've completely forgotten about that. I had seen a few people talk about that on Twitter um and yeah i'm I'm the same as you i have no idea about tax laws especially in the u.s because i'm in australia and we're totally different (laughs) but yeah so i I think there's a lot of um what you said makes a lot of sense uh i'm not sure if it's correct but if it is correct then that's an obvious choice for them to make instead of cashing it out and getting taxed they just open a cdp and and don't get taxed so you know if that's the case good on them Um, i'm sure other projects will do this once they clue into to this if it is actually the case basically so yeah, I, I think we'll see more of this in the future for sure, for sure. Uh, so the last thing I wanted to talk about was a interesting blog piece that uh, Matteo Leibowitz, uh, I hope I said that right, <laughs> um, of the block. Uh, he basically uh, published this piece this week called 
in Bitcoin post issuance an existential threat. It basically goes through what um, is going to pay for securing Bitcoin once the block rewards aren't sufficient. Uh, we've spoken about this before. I'm not sure on the podcast, but we have spoken about this a lot, especially on Twitter, uh, that there isn't actually a solution to this. So uh, Mateo puts forward five possible solutions. Um, and I'll, I'll run through them quickly. So increase block sizes um, to be able to fit more transactions uh, on layer one instead of forcing people to go to layer two. Not a great solution. Uh, he, 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 go, he outlines these solutions in his post. It's a great post. So I do suggest going and, and reading this. Um, but just for the sake of the podcast, I'll summarize. Uh, so the, the next solution was minus setting a minimum t- transaction fee. Uh, that's not going to work for obvious reasons. Um, coordinating that would be a, a nightmare. Uh, it means a fee market can't really develop uh, past a certain point. Um, the third option was transitioning to proof of stake to lower the security costs. This I actually completely agree on, but um, I don't think Bitcoiners or anyone in the Bitcoin community will ever, ever want to do this. They are so against proof of stake, it's not even funny. So we won't even entertain that idea for now. Another more ludicrous solution um, that, and these aren't necessarily Mateo's solutions. These are just ones that he's seen um, published um, out there in the wild. But yeah, the, the, I think the most ludicrous one was the reappropriation of old UTXO. So basically using coins that haven't been moved for maybe five plus years to pay for security. Now, this is absolutely insane. Um, basically, uh, almost everyone I saw has said uh, no. There are a couple of holdouts basically saying maybe it is a, an idea that we should entertain uh, or at least discuss. You know, fair, let's discuss it. But I think that it becomes very, very slippery uh, from there. Uh, even if it was maybe 10 years where coins have been moved for 10 years. So, for example, you know, Satoshi's coins are uh, 10 years old or coming up on 10 years. What if he's or they or, or her or whoever, what if they're not um, they're not dead, um, as people have speculated, or they come back and want their want to claim their Bitcoin at that stage? You know, if, if it's been uh, reappropriated uh, and used to pay uh, for this network security, will the community come together and pay that back later on? Uh, I don't know. It gets all really messy and there's so many hypothetical questions, it's not even worth entertaining. Uh, and the final solution, which I think is the most obvious one, is to introduce um, steady low inflation, which is the path Ethereum is most likely going to take. Now, this is the most obvious solution because... Um, we've seen, um, I know, Yarek, you've done a lot of models on this in, in Ethereum's proof of stake where the inflation, if 5 million ETH is staked, I think, or the issuance rate, sorry, for validators was around 5%. And then for network, it was around 0.5%. So that's 0.5% extra ETH being generated each year. Uh, we could apply the same thing to Bitcoin, uh, but the questions in the air of whether proof of work can be, um, you know, it, it, it works differently because in proof of stake, you obviously have a staking pool. Uh, in proof of work, you have a mining uh, mining pool, but the miners operate on the entire network, whereas proof of stake, there are validators that operate within the network. You know, it, it gets a bit more complex whether uh, inflation actually, uh, low inflation can work on a proof of work chain uh, because traditionally we've seen proof of work chains have high issuance, especially at the start, in order to get miners mining on the chain to secure it to kind of start that snowball effect. Now, whether... Um, you know, it's low inflation works in the long run for proof of work chain is up in the air. Oh man, I know you put this story in the newsletter or for the recap just for me because this is my favorite topic outside of anything Ethereum related. I guess first I'll say the block recently hired Mateo and he's a great hire. He's got a very good background in Ethereum. He does a lot of great deep dives. So it's good to see the block uh, hiring some solid talent and they've been putting out a lot of good deep dives on Ethereum in the last month, which is good to see. I've been a little bit critical of some of the uh, news publications out there that just kind of do gotcha headline type journalism and been pushing people to put better pieces out. And this is definitely, you know, a step in the right direction. So, you know, kind of the core here, in my opinion, I call it a meme. It's Bitcoin's 21 million cap. Um, The only reason Bitcoin can live by that meme at this point is that they haven't actually had to test what happens when the issuance gets lower than miners demand for security of the network. And the reason for this is Bitcoin has been steadily going up and happens in the past to have gone up every time around the happening. So it's pretty much been offset every time. Now we're going to be coming up on another one, I believe in 18 months or so, it'll be cutting the block reward from 12 and a half to, I believe, 6.25 Bitcoin. Now, if price stays at these lows, you're going to start to see hash rate drop off, right? It's inevitable. Now, potentially it goes up again, but in another four years, we're going to be down to just 3.5 
uh, one to five Bitcoin per block. And that's just in six years. Now, the issuance model runs out, I believe, in the year 2140. So that's kind of where everyone focuses. Uh, we'll, we'll be dead. We don't have to worry about it anyways. I've seen a lot on Twitter. That's not true, though, because I think once we get down to that three number or so, that's a lot less issuance than even today, 75 or so percent less. Uh, we're going to start to see some issues. In, in my opinion, the only answer here, the only thing that's going to solve this is introducing inflation because fees aren't even close to paying as much as block rewards right now. I think it's maybe 1% of the network fees are coming from transaction fees. Um, and obviously, Bitcoin's trying to move to Lightning, which would take transactions off the core layer. And so there's all kinds of problems there. But in my opinion, I'm strongly 100% believer that the 21 million cap in Bitcoin will not exist. I know, yeah, I, man, I, I should probably tweet this again. I haven't triggered the maximalist in a while with this idea, but every time I put it out there, I get attacked pretty hard. But you know, the reality is that they just haven't had to face this problem yet, and they're going to face it at some point in the near future. And you can't just cap your chain that depends on miners to secure your valuable network because all the miners are going to leave. No one's going to want to operate at a loss. So how do you fix that? Mateo kind of walks through these five solutions, like you said, in my opinion, kind of the only one is introducing some kind of slow, steady inflation rate. Yeah, exactly. I have seen one other possible solution um, floated, which I don't think is great because it just basically destroys um, Bitcoin as being like P2P cash or whatever. I know it's not really that these days and there's all these narrative changes that happen, but it's basically to make it the fees as high as possible on layer one and for everyone to do everything on layer two. Now, this is ridiculous because if you want the fees to be really, really high to cover security, they need to be, oh man, I don't know the exact number, but they need to be in the hundreds of dollars, potentially one day the thousands of dollars to offset the fact that the issuance halves every four years, uh, the block reward halves every four years. Um, so... And in that case, I actually posed this question on Twitter. If someone only has $100 of Bitcoin and they want to, and the fees are permanently $100 and they want to move their Bitcoin even into a lightning kind of channel, they still have to do a layer one transaction. They can't move it. There was a couple of solutions put forward on the tweets that I didn't, um, I haven't looked into yet, but I don't think there was a solution that elegant, that was elegant, basically. Um, you know, you might be able to sell the uh, like a futures contract on the value of your BTC and then they'd pay the fee for you to move it. Uh, there's, there's lots of derivative products that can be built around it, of course, but I just don't think, I mean, Bitcoin becoming a high, like, val high value settlement layer, basically, where the only people paying the exorbitant fees are maybe channel, uh, lightning channel operators or uh, people that are moving uh, lots of um, Bitcoin across chains, like millions of dollars, where a thousand dollar fee even wouldn't wouldn't really be that much compared to moving something like um, you know everyday wealth around. Which I mean, it remains to be seen if that's a sustainable model. I don't think so. As you said, the easiest thing is to introduce inflation. But my reservations around if inflation can actually, um, you know, if low inflation can actually work under proof of work as uh, as well as it can work under proof of stake remains to be seen. Yeah, like you mentioned earlier, it's got to be a lot higher. I mean, Ethereum proof of stake, we can get away with 0.5% inflation or so, and everyone's going to be happy because validators are being paid you know, that 5% or so. Totally different in proof of work. They would have to have some a much higher, probably five percent network inflation or something like that. And you know, this is just a good reminder. Uh, none of these chains or parameters for them are actually set in stone. Sure, this was the initial kind of issuance schedule for Bitcoin that Satoshi laid out, and everyone thinks it can't change. But the reality is, when you get to a day where you can no longer secure the network because there's no issuance, you're going to have to do something about it. You can't just live by the meme and let your chain die, right? So these are all just social contracts. The majority of the network decides what they want to run. All this stuff can be changed, and it's all up for debate. Yeah, exactly. I think the, the social contract point is very, um, very good, very great point to bring up um, simply because, I don't know, some people seem to think that that 21 million cap is literally set in stone. It cannot be changed no matter what. Yeah, it might be extremely hard to change um, because everyone is on the same page. Uh, well, most people are on the same page and don't want it to be changed. But uh, at the end of the day, users um, you know, run nodes, miners run, run nodes. And if they decide they... Uh, you know, especially if the miners decide, hey, you know, we, we want to get paid more, um, the cap needs to be changed or lifted, um, or else we can't actually mine. 
Um, you know, it depends what happens. Like the miners don't really decide where the chain goes. They follow the ecosystem. Uh, but we might see within maybe the next 10 years, which isn't that long, um, these kind of games start to play out, especially if the price doesn't doesn't increase to, to the levels it needs to. Um, because, you know, if it was to halve today, to get the same security, Bitcoin would need to double to 7,000. And then if it was to, to halve again, 14,000. But the whole premise is that Bitcoin gets secured by as much, um, you know, kind of, by sorry, by more hash power, the um, higher the price goes because the hash power, power follows the price and all that, blah, blah, blah. But what if the price, you know, doesn't go up? And there's there's so many open questions. And, and uh, to be fair, Ethereum hasn't totally solved this. There's still debate around um, whether it's inflation or potentially capped. But I don't think a capped supply is going to work, um, especially for something like Ethereum where fees do actually need to be low. We're not trying to be a, um, you know, a high value settlement network or whatever. But I'm curious to see more research come uh, around this. And I'm, I'm grateful for Matteo putting this piece together. I know Nick Carter mentioned on Twitter, he's working on something around this. Um, and he's usually does some really good deep dives. So I'm, I'm really curious to see what he puts out in the future. So that's it for this week, everyone. Thank you for tuning in. Um, if you haven't subscribed to the newsletter, but you're listening to the podcast, <laughs> go to ethub.substack.com because we're now on Substack and you can read the newsletter, subscribe there. Uh, don't forget to follow the podcast as well, podcast.ethub.io, um, and we'll see everyone next week. Thanks for listening to the Into the Ether podcast. You can subscribe to us at podcast.ethub.io, as well as follow us on Twitter at, at econoar and at zazzle0x.